Welcome back, everyone. This is The Nerdy Truth, and I'm your host, Dr. J.J. Walcott. Our focus is on harnessing innovation to build for the future. And today, we have a special guest, Soren Ardelanu, who is running for president of the United States. She is an independent and a psychologist, and we're excited to have her on the show today to talk to us about her views and what she sees happening in our country. Regardless of which major political party you connect to, there's no denying that there is a significant amount of stress that is happening to all the people in our nation for various reasons. And there's a number of movements that are happening that are very serious and people fall on one or another or, or sometimes even a third side of the, maybe not the side of the coin, but a third position nonetheless. So we're excited to have her on and talk about what her views are and what she's been seeing. So without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Hello, Soren, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you at first. <laughs> oh, no, no, I was just doing a quick introduction uh, to be okay. able to bring you in and to share a little bit about your story before you get started. And oh, um, But mostly, at this point, we'd love to hear from you, um, your background, how you came to this position. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much to unpack. So, so fill us in. Sure, and thank you so much for having me on today. I'm honored to connect with you. Um, I did a little bit of research on you just to get familiar with you, and I feel uh, we have a lot in common, so I'm excited to see where this goes. <laughs> um, so about me, uh, where do I begin? I guess um, maybe let's talk about what's driving me, you know, because this is running for president is something that I have felt I don't have a choice but to do. Um, about 20 years ago, I was just kind of paying attention to what's going on in the world and noticing there's a lot of people blaming other people for their problems and not taking personal responsibility. Um, I had also been um, a product of a very abusive environment as a child. And I ran away from home when I was 14 because um, I love her, my mother, but she, she hit me every time I didn't meet standards and called me all kinds of horrible names. And I was getting to the point where I just didn't want to take it anymore and I couldn't fight back. <laughs> oh, and so, you. for sure. Yeah. No, so this led me to like a path of inquiry and wanting to understand, you know, what drives behavior? Why do people hurt others? Um, why do we hurt ourselves? And so forth. And, you know, again, around 20 years ago is when these things started really um, to come to the forefront for me. I, I studied a psychology at San Francisco State University. I had you know, a degree in, in that, um, focusing on uh, human sexuality and relationships. Like I was a seeker. And at that time, it just hit me. It's our values that drive our behaviors. You know, and I realized, okay, if I want to make a positive impact in the world, because I didn't want anybody else to go through what I went through. I didn't want any other children to be harmed. Right? And I realized, you know, my mother loved me. She just didn't know any better. She was repeating a behavior that she was taught, the way she was treated, right? And so, because most of us are unconscious, most of us are just doing the same things over and over again, especially you know, what we see and experience are in our environment. Even if we don't agree with these things, over time, they become normalized. And so I realized, okay, if I want to address values, I've got to be in a position where I can influence the media, or I can influence education, or I can be considered an authority figure and, you know, I saw that position as being the president of the United States of America because that is the perfect platform for influencing positive change because you don't have to do it by necessarily even literally educating people. You do it by example, by role modeling, right? But I was, you know, not, I was about 20 years old at the time <laughs> and very far from where I am today. And I didn't really give it much weight. And, you know, I went on with my life, but, um, about 10 years ago, I had very significant um, PTSD. I think some people call it CPTSD, but I was um, disabled. I had back spasms, I had ulcers, I lost my voice. I didn't trust anybody, I didn't feel safe. Everything was a trigger. And I kind of got to the point where I was questioning, why am I here? You know, um, I had done a lot of things on paper. I grew up on 
welfare, food stamps, Section 8. And I shared a bunk bed with my mom and my stepdad at times. We we're very poor, okay? I grew up looking not like the people around me. I experienced racism when I was in preschool. Um, I experienced it from kindergarten to eighth grade. And then I experienced the white on white racism from like 14 to 18. So I experienced all kinds of things that most people didn't experience. <laughs> and I didn't let it get the best of me. You know, I actually turned around and like said on paper, I looked like I had it all. I started making six figures. I was selling exotic cars. I co-owned a nightclub, an art gallery. I hung out with rock stars, celebrities, was idolized by them. You know, it's like everybody wants that, right? But I was miserable. And so here I am like wondering, why am I here? I've done it all. And then it just hit me like, wow, I have been attracting all these toxic relationships in my life, professionally, romantically, personally, because I had a very maladaptive pattern that I learned in childhood. I associated love with abuse. And that was when I also realized I can have different experiences. I can choose to believe different things. I can choose to behave differently, including how I treat myself. I can choose to set boundaries with people. And so that was, um, a very pivotal moment for me because at that time one of my friends took me under his wings because I was just falling apart in and out of ER a lot in constant pain you know nobody could help me drugs weren't helping me um, and I was introduced to a philosophy of life and um, it's called concept therapy and it basically deals with the concepts that are in your subconscious mind to reclassify them as fact theory or fantasy because many of us are actually operating off of fantasies and theories right limited false I negative argue beliefs the, whole of the country are operating off of a variety of personally <laughs> fantasies at the moment <laughs> I, I think we could I, I believe the term is there is no truth there is only perception um the non-clinical term of, of what you're describing but yes i mean i i, I think there's an element of, of recognizing how do you filter information how do you categorize them and how do you use it to drive behavior yeah no fair yeah but i think at that national level Level, this is kind of the debate that's happening is it's not just happening to you it, it's it's happening at scale yeah well and, and so this philosophy I've been studying now it's since 2011 it changed my entire life and it hasn't been an easy journey uh, you know it especially when you recognize that you've been subscribed to you know things that are actually holding you down things that aren't true and, you know, recognizing you've been believing in lies, you've trusted people that you shouldn't have, um, and then forgiving yourself, right? And I feel like that's kind of what's going on in the country right now, <laughs> is many of us were fighting to hold on to these fantasies and theories that are actually keeping us down. And we don't want to let go because it means that you, we have to admit that we made not the best decision and that we have to change if we want better. And most people prefer to blame others and say, no, they have to change. I don't have to change, I'm perfect. But everybody else out there has to change or that person has to change or that system has to change, but not me. Um, <laughs> so I get it. Very poppins, practically perfect in every way, but of course all of them emphasize the word practically, not practically. <laughs> not, not really perfect. But yes, of course, I mean, people want to believe that essentially, right, that, that we operate uh, as best we can, and therefore we have made good decisions, whether they have been good or not. Um, I, that's a normal human bias, right? But like you were pointing out, when that hits across a nation at scale, then it has this ripple effect of, of almost group fantasy problems and, and group blaming and... And now it's just, it's spiraled into its own chaos. Yeah, it's, it's a really big deal. It's, I think especially for some people when, like one of the things I went through, I had a mentor for about seven years and he was a master hypnotist and I didn't realize this till the end. I idolized him. I wanted to be just like him, right? And a lot of us do this with people, you know, we idolize people. We think that they're holier than thou. No, you know, we're all human nobody is perfect <laughs> and for me my greatest pain came from when I actually was in it was in 2018 when I finally like severed ties with this mentor it was like recognizing like oh my goodness like for the past seven years I ignored my intuition because I knew something was amiss but I believe you know because other people you know idolize this person he's kind of a celebrity and celebrities idolize him I was like who am I 
you know, what do I know? Right. And so when I finally realized like, no, I do know, and I should have trusted myself. Right. And so I'm sharing this because I'm sure a lot of people are either going through this right now or they're going to go through it, especially with what's going on politically right now. We have, you know, people that are manipulating uh, troops to serve their own agendas and it's very dangerous, but you know, people on the receiving end, forgiveness is such a big thing, need to be forgiving with themselves, need to realize that, you know, we all have the ability to see, you know, between the lines to see the truth and we need to trust ourselves more um you know in concept therapy one of the things i learned is how to reason you know inductively and deductively most of us don't reason inductively fully or correctly and that really helps with discernment right like we have a few pieces of data and then we jump to a conclusion but if we have a few more pieces of data the conclusion might be different right so like this is why general generalizations are very dangerous right like not all people that look like me have the same story and like, you know, not all police officers are a certain way, you know, and, and so forth. But it's like, we need to treat people as individuals, get to know them, not be quick to rush to confusion, um, you know, to judgments rather, because it leads to confusion. And that's for me, probably the story of my life is that I'm always being misjudged. You know, people look at me and they think, oh, that I've had a really easy life. It's like, no, I've had a very difficult and challenging life, but I'm grateful for it because it led me to where I am now. So I'm able to help others understand that. Um, but back to running for POTUS, <laughs> I do want to address that because along this path, since I started really working with the concepts in my mind and changing my belief system and really, um, uncovering all the stones I can because I'm a skeptic. I don't just believe things because somebody tells me or because they're famous or they have certain credentials. I used to, <laughs> but I don't anymore. Um, and along this journey, I started to feel literally called to run in 2020. Um, I, I had, I call it a vision, but I don't actually see things when I close my eyes, but I had a vision um, of people chanting Serene 2020 about a decade ago, and it freaked me out because I have quite a colorful past. I've done a lot of things that I will never do again. I don't regret them because of where it led me, right? But it was just, I had imposter syndrome and I was, you know, I was afraid. Um, but then as this year starting it getting closer and closer, other people saw me in that position, told me that without me ever telling them. And I tried to resist, I tried to think about, oh, maybe I can do something else. And it literally started to destroy my body. I started to get physically sick. I started to experience pain again. And so I realized, you know what? I have to surrender. What do I have to lose? What is the worst thing that can possibly happen? I make a positive impact and I free myself. And so that's why I'm running. Uh, you know, a big reason is like, I don't have a choice. Like I tried to negotiate this. I'm like, you know, I could go be like, hang out like a, on an overwater bungalow in the middle of the, you know, South Pacific. Like, I couldn't do that. <laughs> it sounds lovely, right? Sounds like, kind of good. <laughs> right? But I couldn't do it. I was like, but I know better. Like, I can't hold back what I have inside. Like, I feel that I really do have something that benefits humanity. I don't think that I'm special. I don't think I'm the only one. But I do believe that it is part of my path to give what I have inside with others. And I have ignited and seen other people inspired by what I'm doing. So I know that this is growing. I know that there are more that are getting involved because one person cannot change the whole world, cannot change the country, cannot change the whole system. We need a lot of people with their hearts and minds in the right place to step up. And I'm honored, you know, that people are responding to me and being supportive and also stepping up on the wall. Good. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my position when, when I went around the country really was to uh, test a theory, right? And, and the theory was that we haven't uncovered all of the rocks. In other words, all the citizens in our country that really could contribute, maybe not to being president, but the concept of the presidency, right? The idea that as we come together as a nation, we are able to affect change positively. And that it's not just a ruling class, or maybe it is. And, and so to your point of you know, having a personal inspiration, having a story that needs to be told, uh, having a message that you hope gets heard. I, I think those are all the reasons that people who are less likely to win, we'll say, um, do take this on because there's, there's, a, there's a concept behind all of it. Um, I certainly got the question all the time, okay, so you can't win, so what's your real goal? 
I have to imagine you've heard some of those kinds of questions. Um, and, and so I'll pose it to you, but I will caveat it a little bit. I spent a lot of time in government and, and serving overseas, serving in the Pentagon. My knowledge of how government works, how the budgets work, how all the intricacies of this works um, was something that is you know, working capital for me. How would you get into a space? I mean, you're talking 2.4 million government workers, 2.1 million military personnel. Um, that's, that's larger than any company we have worldwide. That's a lot to learn. So if you were to achieve the impossible, how, how would you jump into all of that and learn that? Your position is fantastic of we need to come together and work together, but there are real tangible tasks that have to occur. And, and so I wonder, you know, with, within your realm of, you know, what you're questioning for yourself and what you're sharing with people, how do you explain that element? Sure. I mean, a big part of this journey, too, has been having faith in myself, right? And so I surround myself with people that know more about things that I don't, right? I, I, I ask people questions, you know? I educate myself. I always admit that I don't have all the answers. And I believe, again, collaboration is a really big part of it. But integrity, right? It's not just picking experts. It's picking people who have integrity that care about doing the right thing for humanity that are able to put aside their personal likes and dislikes, right? Because that's a big part of my journey too. It's like, it doesn't matter what I want, right? It doesn't matter what I think is right. It's about doing the right thing at all times. And so um, another big part of my journey has been in, with concept therapy would help me is I'm um, learning natural laws, learning universal laws, uni learning basic principles. Because if you understand how life works, if you understand how human beings work, if you understand what drives behavior, you can approach any challenge from that perspective. Right. And so I surround myself with people that know more than me and I keep educating myself, you know, and I'm not talking about, you know, degrees, right, because there are many credentialed people out there that unfortunately don't know as much as people who don't, right? It's just a piece of paper where, you know, they maybe memorize things. And I don't mean that with disrespect. There's also many out there that are masters and are very good at what they do, but I don't believe that credentials or not credentials actually uh, equate to the quality that you're getting from the person. And is, again, back to integrity. That is so important to me because what I learned, especially from this master hypnotist, was that, you know, there are many great actors out there that know what to say, that know how to behave, but you have to pay attention to the subtleties, right? You know, how do they speak to other people? How do they, you know, think about them or speak about themselves and, and what are the purpose of what they're doing? Like the, the hypnotist, he's a really famous uh, healer. He's a doctor. He's a licensed doctor. People fly in from all over the world to see him. On paper, he looks good, but I was actually very close to him and I got to see the inner workings of his mind because it just starts to slip out eventually, right? So this is not somebody I would partner with in the future, for example, right? So it's patience, collaboration, um, and, you know, again, just integrity, surrounding myself with people that consistently are doing their best, admit that they're human, like somebody that thinks that they're perfect or says they have all the answers, I run away from. <laughs> Um, because I know this is a great feat, and I do believe it's possible. Maybe not this year. Maybe so. Who knows? There's so much that can happen this year, and I'm just giving 100%. I'm not going anywhere. Like, I realize, like, I have to keep moving forward with this, that, you know, I have to wake up more people. I have to ignite more people. So as you do that, how, how do you sit on your positions for various issues? For example, um, uh, take the environment, right? Obviously, it's a hot topic. Some people talk about the Green New Deal. Um, some people talk about the research. Some people talk about reducing uh, the, the rules and legislative actions. Uh, some folks talk about the, um, you know, the, the, the various things that a president can do or can't do, how they fund, where they put money, uh, how they deal internationally. Um, where, where would you say you land on what you would want to see in the environment per, per, per se? Um, as far as how would you change the budget? What would you invest in? How would you um, solve the problems that we're facing today, recognizing that we actually have a lot of work happening now already? So I think this is my approach to many things is to bring together experts with opposing opinions, 
and have open debates and conversations so that we can learn together. Um, I do not, uh, you know, the president actually doesn't have as much power as many people think they do. And I don't believe in being a dictator in the sense, you know, like, like I'm not going to issue executive orders just to get my way. You know, I, I want to really have people in alignment because the whole point of me running was to make this an organic movement, you know, of evolution of consciousness. And so there will be some educating in that sense. Um, I feel that there is legislation, especially because I'm in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Last, last week was the first time in my life. I've lived here for three and a half decades that we had a day that was dark and not sunny. Okay. And, and so I'm right here. We haven't been able to breathe very well. So I know what's going on very well. Um, and so I started looking at some of the things we've been doing, like in the state, for example, and I don't know all the answers. Okay. So, um, nobody, please don't hold that against me. But one of the things I noticed is like, we've had legislation for about a century now that hasn't been allowing us to do what the native Americans did. You know, they used to have like controlled burns, right? Like, and so things wouldn't blow out of proportion again. I don't know if this is the answer, but I believe this is something we should consider. You know, the other thing is there's this theory that we're, you know, experiencing a, the sixth mass extin extinction, right? Like mm -hmm. we know that everything in this world is temporary. And I know a lot of people have a hard time accepting that because it's like, we want to live as long as possible. Yeah. But there's only so much we can do to extend our life. And so I do, and our life on the planet. Um, I do believe we need to invest in those things, right? Like as a human being, if I eat correctly, if I move correctly, sleep correctly and clean correctly, I'll extend my life significantly, right? And we can do the same thing with our planet, right? We can extend the planet's lifetime, but we have to also be realistic and realize there's so much, only so much that we can do. But, um, you know, like I read an article actually in NPR a couple of days ago about recycling and how it's actually not as good as we thought it was. Right? There was a lot of marketing pushing it, you know, to make it seem like it's the best, the way that we're handling it, okay? There are better ways, but the way that we've been pushed to handle it isn't necessarily actually helping our environment. So we need to have more honest conversations. We need people that have the courage to speak the truth, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't make them popular. We need to show facts, and we need to show the different perspectives and help people realize, like, we're working on this, but nobody has the perfect solution. We just have theories. You know, this is so much greater than us. And I hope that makes sense where I'm coming from. I know it's not necessarily the most direct answer, but again, I'm just being honest because I know that nobody has all the answers. We just have a lot of theories and all we can do is try and, and learn from the things that didn't work and learn from the things that did. Well, I would say it goes a little bit deeper than that, right? The International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has done extensive research that includes uh, many, many different countries from very different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, belief systems, theories, et cetera. And the data is very, very strong, um, much harder than in our own area of psychology, right? And so there, there is this data that's very clear. That said, um, oftentimes people would ask, say, about the Green New Deal. Have you had a chance to review that legislation? Look a little bit, but not fully. And I've had friends that have like shared their own versions of it with me to try to get me to push it. Um, <laughs> but it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm fully educated on it. No, right. It's not a thing. It's a summary of the research. And so it's an accurate summary, but it is not actually a plan of any sort. And so as POTUS, the expectation would be to translate that science into action. But the difficulty would be, um, from, from your description is if you have multiple people coming from different perspectives, how do you discern who is, whose perspective is ground in the science and facts? Um, we look at results. <laughs> well, and, and so this is where the argument, I, and I think this gets to the core of where politics gets really hard, um, talking to folks who have different perspectives, uh, whether they're from the right or the left or somewhere in the middle, is that none of us could be educated in all of these areas, right? I purposefully chose environment because it is outside of both of our, uh, our, our, our true education space, right? Our formal education comes in the area of human connections and, and understanding how that works. The environment is science. So as a scientist, I can certainly read the data, understand it, digest it, and translate it. But it's, it's not my formal area of expertise. And, and the challenge became when I spoke to people is I think to come full circle to your earlier point, I like to say people are working and making decisions with five pieces of a 5,000 piece puzzle, right? We, we don't have 
the data and we don't have the information on the people making decisions to be able to completely make sense of it and make these global at scale decisions for the country, which in and of itself is hugely challenging. So yeah. it, it, it really is. I mean, it's, it's a massive endeavor and I, I find it interesting and I talk a lot about it in my book that we hire for charisma and what we need are problem solvers and people who understand people, as you put it, right? Who can, who can distinguish between those who are, are truth tellers and who are, are coming with facts uh, from those that are speaking from perception or belief systems or biases. So the other thing you actually reminded me of, um, you know, when we first uh, developed x-rays, um, we started x-raying pregnant women. And, you know, for about 25 years, we had this very high um, infantile cancer rates, right? And, and there, was, there were some scientists that figured out the correlation that x-raying pregnant women leads to this cancer in infants. And they went around trying to stop everybody and tell everybody. And it took 25 years for them to stop, right? And so I wonder, you know, why was there so much resistance, right? And I don't want to, you know, speculate, but I am going to a little bit in the sense that, you know, was there, you know, money behind it? What was there an agenda behind it? Because I look at, you know, agriculture, for example, and, and the effect of subsidies on our environment, on the animals, on humans. If we got rid of that, I feel that we would have a free, not only a freer market, but people would make better decisions, right? Because if we, you know, didn't subsidize certain practices, people wouldn't pay for them right if they were more expensive people might make a different choice and then we would also have less negative consequences it's just an idea but it's something that i've been noticing and paying attention to it's like well why do we push certain things who has to profit from this and that's why it is important to be able to understand not just the science but where is it coming from and what's driving them you know what's in it for them um, there's many people say follow the money you know <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was part of my job inside government was to do that. And, and it was very, very informative because you could, you could see where the strings were being pulled and then how that was going to have a ripple effect out to the American people. So on that point, uh, one of the questions I got asked frequently, so I will, I will pose it to you as well. Why not start with a local office? Or I'll add one piece to it, though I wasn't asked this, but I think it is important to ask. Why not start with a government job where you could, in both cases, have an immediate impact and build the name that you are trying to create? Sure. Well, kind of back to why I'm running is I don't have a choice. And I've tried to talk myself out of this position for many years, and I couldn't do it. And part of the reason I realized, well, there's a few reasons. Um, I've worked for very unethical people in the past, and I don't like to have to... Uh, feel pressured to do things out of integrity. Uh, that's some, you know, that was part of what led to me having severe PTSD is I was selling exotic cars. I was working for companies like Bentley and Lamborghini and Tesla and Spiker. And I was being pressured to be dishonest with my clients and I couldn't do it. You know, it was tearing me apart because to me, like, I don't care if I've never met you before. I don't care if I like you or not. I love you and I'm not going to do anything to harm you. That's just who I am, okay? Um, and the other thing is, I don't want to play politics. I realize, like, you know, I'm not a politician. I don't want to get into it. I have friends that are politicians that are working in government. I know what they go through. I know that there's a lot of games going on. And it's just not who I'm going to be. Um, I realize that I can make a lot of positive impact from the outside if I don't win. And I will continue to do that. Um, I got involved in criminal justice reform a couple of years ago. Um, I'm an advisory board member to a nonprofit and I also advise another board. And um, I do things on the side to help people. I create educational programs to help people reprogram their minds, to teach them how to go from surviving to thriving. So there are so many other things I can do without getting into government, without being a politician. And I just, I, I'm gonna, as president, I'm just gonna get in, do my job and get out. I'm not there to like, you know, make a career out of it. I'm just going to be there to do, you know, whatever I need to do to help lift people up, to change this, you know, the systems, the atmosphere. But I, that's not that's not what I'm gonna spend my entire life on. That's just get in, get out, and that's it. <laughs> I hope that makes sense, but it's just, you know, I've thought about it many times and it's just, I, I can't see myself doing anything else. And it's not because I think it's beneath me. I think those roles are very vital but it's not my path. 
it, you know, we're not all called to do the same things and I have to honor what I felt called to do. I have to trust myself and we all should, you know, and, and I think that's really important for people to recognize. It's like, I didn't want to be president, you know, I just felt called and I'm like, you know, I got to try it. And I make sense to me now that I'm here, now that I'm looking at the atmosphere and the other people that are running and what they have to offer. It's like, there's nobody else out there with this vision, with these ideas, with this experience that can offer this. And I have certain gifts that I just don't see anybody else using, but I do believe we all have that same potential, you know, to tap into certain gifts and use them for good. So again, I, I don't think that I'm special, but I think we're all special and we just have to trust where we're guided and go with it. So how does that translate to being a commander in chief? You know, overseeing the military is is one of the top three requirements of president. How how how, how would you step into that role? There, there's a lot there. So uh, yes. I think it's it's not just positivity or interaction. Oh yeah. You know, this is understanding the entire culture of the Department of Defense and, and all that comes with it. So how, how would you step into those shoes? So similar to answering your earlier question, because I'm not an expert in that, I would, I would get to know as much as I can from the people that are the experts that are already there. Um, there are certain things that I understand are vital, like national security, that, you know, we need to protect our country. Um, I know that we've done things that have upset other countries in the past. One of the things that I, I want to work on that I've mentioned many times in other places is, you know, first 100 days in office, I'm going to invite leaders from around the world to connect with me, to get to know them, to understand what their challenges are, and to help them resolve them. Because I do believe that focusing on peace is a lot more uh, profitable and just worthwhile for us and focusing on war. You know, we should be prepared to protect ourselves. We should be trained. We should have experts, not somebody who isn't an expert leading. So I believe that, you know, I'm not going to make any decisions in that regard fully on my own. I'm not going to be impulsive. That's the job. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, to be fair, the actual job yes. is to be the lead speaker for our country internationally to oversee the workers, the human resources piece of it, and be the commander in chief. And so I, I would challenge that passing that position to somebody else is that- well, that's not what I meant. No, sorry. No, I wouldn't pass it on. I would educate myself with people that are already there, that are already experienced, right? I'm, I just am saying that I would not be impulsive. I wouldn't say, okay, let's do this without consulting first, right? I would, I would make sure that I know what I'm requesting before I make that request because there are many, like you said, millions of people's lives at stake, you know, with every command that the commander in chief makes. And so I would take that as a very great responsibility, you know, and not, like I said, I think that it's very important that position to not be impulsive, to think things through and to find the most peaceful way to reach whatever we're trying, you know, to attain. And, but, but again, I am a realist because I understand that there are countries that don't necessarily like us and we need to protect ourselves from them, but we also need to work on like making them get along, not making them, but you know, learning to get along with each other so that they are not feeling threatened by us and we're not, you know, I believe that we're all on the same team, essentially. We're all human beings. We all share the same planet. I don't think that any country truly wants to have war, right? Because we don't progress, right, when those things happen. And so I feel like we can find a way to get along and to not have to invest as many resources in that. I don't believe this will happen overnight. <laughs> I believe this will take a, a while, but I'm willing to do the work and I'm willing to surround myself with people who know better so that I can know better as well. Well, I love it. And, and so I'll close out with this. Uh, you know, assuming November comes and goes, we wish you well, of course, uh, in, in that fight, but if it comes and goes and you're preparing for 24 what is it that you would say are you're going to be your top three areas of focus and education for yourself to be prepared for that? I'm, I'm going to continue understanding human behavior and mastering, you know, how to influence behaviors of integrity. I'm going to continue empowering, inspiring, and educating people who are open and to continue to reach out to people who know more than me. You know, and regardless of what happens, you know, whether I win or 
I win. <laughs> you know, it's still winning because I'm evolving and I'm lifting other people with me. Wonderful. So how do people follow you? Sure. So um, I have a website at serene2020.com and I'm on social media, on Facebook. I probably share the most. I, I love to write. <laughs> so if I, I write a lot on Facebook, but Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I'm the only Serene Ardellianu <laughs> in the world. So it's very easy to find me. Yes, Serene2020. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. This is The Nerdy Truth, and I'm your host, Dr. JJ Walton.